Um, I often start off sessions like this, um, not that I run sessions like this, but, but rather than speaking at, at a conference or a huge room full of uh, faces in the distance, I, I, I ask people, how many of you have actually worked in a restaurant, maybe washing dishes or serving, whether it's been a holiday job or full-time paid job? How many have actually worked in the industry? Yeah, OK, that, that's about right. I normally find around about 60 or 70 percent of people have actually had some experience of the industry that I'm going to talk about, um, and yet they know very little about it. Um, and I think that's partly because it is a big industry, partly because it is fragmented, and partly because actually, although people work in it, it doesn't grab their attention enough for them to carry on or want to carry on working in it. And I think that's a big shame because it's a great industry and it's great fun and it's full of nice people uh, because it's part of the hospitality industry and hospitality is all about making people feel comfortable. Anyway, that's, that's the introduction over. And what I'd like to do to talk about is, is a number of things um, with, um, with the opportunity for us to sort of cut things out or, or add as we go along. But I want to do a little bit of introduction and a little bit of contextual piece so that we know what we're talking about. And I'm going to be talking about the UK, um, but most E European countries, most um, Western countries follow similar patterns. The numbers may be different, but the general trends, the general issues are very, very similar. Um, less developed countries, uh, about which I know much less, have a, have, will have a different eating out market. And interestingly, um, in very undeveloped countries, eating out is actually quite an important consideration because people don't have time or the ability to cook and eat at home. Um, and in fact, there, were more, um, there was more street food in London in the 12th century than there is now. So th there's a fact to take away with you. Um, anyway, I want to introduce the industry and put it into some sort of context. Then I'm going to look at the sector from the, cons from the consumer, because after all, it's the consumer's the most important person, and then look at the operator. And by operator, I mean people who run restaurants or canteens or whatever. Um, I want to look at the distribution chain because it is quite significant for the food service industry. Um, and when I say the distribution chain, I mean from, from the farm to the outlet or from the factory to the outlet. I don't mean from the, uh, the cow or the, the fish. Um, I want to look at the supplier because suppliers have particular issues in the food service sector. And then we'll put it all back together again. And then there are some other things about what's happening on menus, what's happening generally in the industry and where is it going and why, and so look at some of the key players. And along the way, what I want to address is one important topic, which is the, the relationship between food service, which I'll define in a minute, and the retail market. Um, and this, this was really a, a, a starting point for, for the discussion that Tim and I had a, a few months ago. Um, so it's the relationship between retail and food service, which I'll touch on um, two or three times. And then we'll put it all, wrap it all up, ask questions and go home. Is that all right? OK, good. So um, just a bit about me. I, I'm a scientist by training. I worked at a company called RHM. And my main claim to fame is that I worked on a product in a, in a test tube, which eventually became corn. So uh, I, I know that product. You're going to stay as what it really is. Sorry. <laughs> I then worked for a trade association um, to, for two years as their scientific officer, but since I didn't know what they were doing, um, I left as, as soon as I could, and I got into market research, and I've been doing that for, it says, 30 years, but actually a bit longer than that. Um, I'm told I'm the industry's leading supplier and interpreter of e information about the food service market. Um, and just to blow my trumpet a little bit, I was, I was at a presentation or a, an internal meeting organised by Booker 
uh, the four and a half billion pound um, cash and carry and delivered food wholesaler and the chief executive introduced me to his top trading team and he said this is Peter Backman he knows more about food service than anyone else on the planet <laughs> <laughs> but um, but it's a um, it is a huge industry uh, and nobody I think can know more than just a tiny little bit so I've got the privilege of sharing that with you um, I'm also the chairman of an organization called ARENA, which is a networking organization, rather expensive, I'm afraid, uh, uh, but it gets people together to talk about the industry. Um, this is a bit about Horizons. I'm not going to give you a big sales pitch. If you want to look on our website, then www.hrzns.com. That's Horizons without the vowels. I did try to buy Horizons.com, but I was told it would be six figures. Uh, so I we got HRZNS instead, which cost 35 quid. So that was a good deal. And that little, um, this thing here, if you click on there, it takes you to a bigger version of it and you can hover over it and there's numbers and statistics. And also actually, if you go to resources, there's a drop down um, which will take you to some free reports. You have to register, but, but um, that's, uh, that's all that there is to it. And then there, there's some free stuff there as well. Um, we provide information and insight. We only work in the food service industry. Um, UK focus, but we look at U Europe. Uh, also do a certain amount of work in the Gulf and keep a very close eye on what's happening in the States because although it's not a very, um, it's not as innovative as the UK, uh, it's where an awful lot of attention is paid and where a lot of the key ideas about management, about marketing um, and, and developing business uh, uh, comes from. So, and we work for operators, distributors, manufacturers and the investment community. Um, that just explains what we do, but uh, uh, what I'm going to do, what I'm going to talk about is based on my experience and on all the work that Horizons does. Um, the information that I'm going to present is um, we're, in the, we're in the process of uh, creating or uh, developing our 2014 base year data. So most of the information that we provide at the moment is still 2013, but I've, I've sort of updated it where I can. Um, the information is from Horizons and the values that I'm going to be talking about is primarily food, but you've got to bear in mind that the industry, of course, sells a lot of booze. Uh, and spends a lot of money on other things as well. So, is that all right, incidentally? Is that, are people comfortable with that? Yeah? Okay, good. So, um, first of all, how big is this industry? And this is, from here on, we're mainly talking UK. Um, sales last year of food and drink by the food service industry, which, as I said, I will define, is £46.6 billion. Pounds. Um, that excludes a lot of alcohol which is served in pubs and student, union, student unions and in hotel bars. Drink which is consumed without food or without proper food as my mother would say. Um, so a packet of nuts and a, and a drink doesn't count as a meal. So excluding all that drink which is primarily alcohol but a bit of soft drink as well. If you add that in then you've got about another 16 or 17 billion pounds. So another way of looking at this industry is to say it's worth getting on for 65 billion pounds a year. Um, out of that figure, the food element of sales to the consumer is 34.5 billion pounds. Um, and <coughs> operators buy, or well, that's what they sell in the way of food, and they spend 10.7 billion pounds on food. So it's a magic, really. They buy 10 billion pounds worth of food and sell it for 35 billion. Wow. You know, everybody must be rolling in it in that industry. Um, the trouble is, um, you have to do quite a lot of work to convert that into that. Um, and that, if you like, is a, a bit of a theme about the industry. It's the labour bit that is hugely important uh, to the industry. And that's one of the reasons why we refer to it as food service, because although you go into a restaurant for food, or you think you do, actually what, a, what most people go into a restaurant for is the more of the experience 
and the food comes along with it. The food, if you like, is a reason for going into a restaurant rather than what you're actually paying for. If you go to a supermarket, you want to buy your food. You just certainly don't go for the experience. But if you go to a restaurant or a pub or um, um, even sometimes if you're going to eat at work, that counts as an as experience and that requires service. So food service is the in name of the industry for a reason and the service bit converts 10.7 to 34.5 billion pounds. <coughs> um, wholesalers and distributors generally are quite important in this industry more so than they are in the retail market, in the UK anyway. Um, and they take around about just over £3 billion pounds worth, uh, they charge it's about £3 billion pounds worth of, to store stuff in warehouses, to put it on lorries and to deliver it. Um, so what leaves primarily the factory, but it may be the farm or the market, um, is £7.5 billion pounds worth of food. So the trick is to convert £7.5 billion pounds into £46.6 .6 billion pounds worth of sales. And that's really what the industry does. Um, and along the way, it serves 7.9 billion meals a year. That figure um, is down on a number from 2006, which was the figure at the start of the recession. So the industry has been in decline for the last, getting on for the best part of a decade, although in the last year or two, it has started to increase again. So that's the industry in a nutshell. And if you need go away with nothing else, go away with that. Um, so um, I said I'm going to talk a bit about the retail industry. And so let me put this, th these two things here. They represent that £46.6 .6 billion pounds that I mentioned on the previous chart. That is the food service market. Um, that is the retail market. Um, it sells a load, a load more food and drink. And food service is 28% of that market. So in the UK, food service is 28% in terms of expenditure on food and drink. is 28% of the total picture, um, excluding all that booze that I've excluded before. So if you add that in, of course, the food service market is less. And that market is worth was worth £155 billion in 2013, that total system. Um, but as I said, I think it's incorrect to see food, service and retail as equivalent. Um, they are very similar and they serve a lot of food, but they are different because of the service element in the food service bit. So if we go and look at it another way and we say, well, that's the equivalent of the, the two bits I, sh I started off the previous slide with and they're, they're the wrong colours, I'm sorry. Um, and the uh, pale blue bit is actually the element which is served in schools, in care homes, in hospitals, in prisons, meals on wheels and at work. Um, all of that, well, you can argue, and I'm going to argue for the sake, because that's my, what my chart looks like, um, that that is not part of the hospitality industry. So we'll take that out, but instead we're going to add in the booze, which is the, the purple bit, the booze that I excluded, and all the rest of the hospitality industry, staying in a hotel, gambling, um, going and watching football matches, joining a club, all of that. So the food service industry is part of the leisure, the hospitality market as well. And food service accounts for 33% of that market. So just quite convenient, 33% of this market, 29% roughly the same percentage of the food market. Uh, so food service sits in two markets, and if you add them all together, you then get this picture here with the market worth um, £234 billion, with food service being 19%. So that's my take on the contextual piece about food service in the UK. In most European countries, those numbers are roughly the same. The percentages are probably a bit higher in the UK than they are in most other European countries. But if you go into the States, the 28% that I mentioned before is closer to 48%. The Americans eat much more food out of home than we do. Um, there are a number of reasons for it. But the big, big difference um, when you look at the, 
where that percent, that difference between 28% and 48%, where that comes from, it's the fast food market. It's burgers, it's fried chicken, it's all of that. So the Americans do that in a way that we just don't in the UK and in Europe. Um, there's partly cultural things at work there, I think there's pricing things at work and so on. Um, so if anybody's interested in that topic, I think it's a very interesting one that I haven't fully bottomed. All I can do is just say, this is what the UK looks like, this is what the, what the US looks like. Okay? I, I need, if, you, if it's not okay, just sort of put your head on the desk and go to sleep <laughs> and then I'll know. Okay, so 46.6 billion pounds is the income. Um, this number here, which says 44 billion, is actually the 2013 number. If you update it for 2014, it's over 46 billion. So, food service operators take in 46 billion pounds a year, and they spend 46 billion pounds. The industry as a whole pr is probably loss-making, chronically loss-making for year after year after year. This isn't a recessionary thing, this is a function of the industry. And there are probably two main reasons for that. One is that um, the, uh, there are big elements of it which are subsidised. So canteens, many canteens, um, eating at work, um, uh, eating in school, m probably costs or well, costs less to pr to sell, uh, to pr cost more to produce than it is sold at, and the difference is then subsidised. <coughs> so that subsidy it um, helps the, the industry uh, to to uh, um, operate in in certain sectors, and another reason why. Uh, it as, an, as a system, it sells um, less than, or about the same as it costs, is that there are, uh, there's a high failure rate, particularly in restaurants, in pubs, uh, in smaller hotels, uh, um, in takeaways. There's a big failure rate. And failure, it, it's not good, but, but um, it, it, it's okay until such time as a business closes then all the losses in the business get crystallised and get taken away from the, the value of the sales into the market. So the industry, as I say, ha finds overall that its costs are greater than its income. Um, for a lot of people that doesn't matter because they're doing very well. You know, a lot of the, the restaurant chains that we, we all know about and, and see and visit all the time and a lot of the pubs, and a lot of the quick service outlets, it's not a problem because they're making money and helping to, if you like, to subsidise the rest of the industry. If you were to consider UK food service PLC as a business, it's loss making um, and the loss making bits are subsidised by the profit making bits. <clears throat> now that sort of helps, it helps to understand quite a lot of things that are going on in the industry. Um, but let, let's just look at what people spend, what the, the industry spends its money on. Food is a quarter of what it spends money on. Um, so it's important, but it's not as, as important as it is in the retail market. Obviously, if you're selling food into, in a retail market, then the cost of the food is very important, um, much more important than the food service industry. So a quarter of the expenditures on food um, a bit on soft drinks and a bit on alcohol, so that's about a third of the market. The next third is labour, uh, and the trouble with labour is that it's um, uh, not easy to control. In fact, it's very easy for the labour, by which I mean the serving staff, the kitchen staff, the delivery people, all of that, can get it, can get it wrong and can make mistakes. So controlling labour in an industry which does not pay um, uh, the best wages, uh, and there are a number of reasons for that, um, um, means that the industry is very reliant on labour, um, not only to get the job done, but in terms of controlling its costs. So labour, uh, if you talk to operators in the market and ask them what their two biggest problems are, the number one problem is labour. Um, the next problem is finding a suitable place to operate from. 
food doesn't feature because food is available and you've got choice and it varies and, uh, um, you know, it's just not a problem. And then the final third is a whole load of other things like, um, well, kitchen stuff and rent and um, paying the lawyers and all that sort of thing. So a third is food and drink, a third is labour and a third is everything else. Now those ratios actually apply in whichever food service market you look at and whichever country you look at. It's a, if you like, it's a fundamental. The, the numbers, the percentages will vary a bit. So that's by way of background to the industry and hopefully it gives you some sort of grounding. Do we have any questions or comments? I mean, I'm happy to carry on, but I just want to give people the opportunity to, to ask a question. A question. Ah. The definition of, of food service that you put up in terms of fast food and what's, what is or isn't. I haven't food. defined it yet. Okay. <laughs> if you take out the fast food, then there's lots of cold food. I mean, I'm looking at Ireland at the moment, and what's happening there is far in places like that are doing self service kind Yes, of yeah. And that's the big trend. Where would they fit in your model? Um, we'll come to that. Okay. 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 Here's one I planted. No, that, that's fa fa fair enough. Fair enough. I know. I know one should talk. One should define one's terms first. But I can bore you to death with the definitions, and we'd have never got to the interesting bits. Okay. I'm still stuck on how can it be loss making. But let's come back to it. Okay. So um, if we look at the consumer, um, the consumer is the consumer. Um, Different types of outlets will have different consumers shopping in them, uh, but the consumer is the consumer, and all of these things are sort of relevant to the industry. They influence who is shopping, uh, in what outlets, um, how often they eat out, and so on. The number which I like most is the 1.9 million more women than men. I'm not sure if it's actually 1.9, but it's roughly that. Um, you didn't know that. No? Okay, the, the trouble is about 85% of them are over the age of 80. <laughs> anyway, um, so, you know, there, there's, there's loads of things in, impacting on the consumer. I think one of the, the issues is about um, time uh, and uh, lack of it. They're not making it anymore. Um, the... Uh, we have more time available to us to do discretionary things now than we had, say, 20, 30, 40 years ago. The big problem is we've just got far bigger choice on what to spend it on. And the eating out market has got to take its, uh, fight, fight its corner in the time space as well as in the money space. Um, some years ago, I did a certain amount of work looking at the amount of money people spend on things per hour. So if you go for a meal out and you spend £15 on the meal out and it takes you an hour, that's £15. If you go and watch a football match and it costs you £60 and it takes you three hours, that is £20 an hour, roughly equivalent time. So there, there seems to be some sort of equivalence about in the amount of time, the amount of amount we spend per minute of free time and the food service industry has got to fight for its, its uh, corner on that one. Um, looking, at, uh, looking at some numbers and this is based on, on work that we do twice a year looking at uh, people who eat out. This, this one looks at the... F um, it's called who eats out but it isn't. It's um, how often... Uh, how many people eat out in the in the last fortnight. And the, um, the figure is roughly 70% of people eat out at least once in the last fortnight. And it's gone up and down through the recession. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm assuming we're not going to get obsessed by what's been happening over the last two or three years. I can do that if you want. But it's, it's around about 70%. It's gone up and down. The good news is it's going up. So slightly, people are eating out slightly more often. Um, but uh, the, um, 
the number of occasions that they take um, has been sort of dropping, although it's just gone up in the last, um, last year or so. So um, th actually the earlier parts of this chart shouldn't be there because they're based on a slightly different question. So it's really from July 11 that we're looking at. Um, and th this says that um, when the people who eat out, you generally eat out once a week, twice a fortnight. That's on average. This excludes children under the age of 80, under the age of 16, and the children under the age of 16 eat out more often than you guys do because they're eating at school um, and um, that can easily be uh, three, four, five times a week um, or, or be only for 19 weeks in the year. But it's a, it's a, big, a lot of eating out that they do. And um, uh, so that, it, that excludes children. It also excludes people who are in hospital because they can't answer our survey and, the, and people in prison and so on. I don't want you to get the idea that prison is a big market. Excuse me. But, excuse me, I'm just awfully rude. Um, um, but it, uh, um, about 10 years ago, it was the fastest growing eating out market in the country because we were sending more and more people to prison. Anyway, that's a, neither here nor there. So that, that is the consumer in this country, and I would imagine in, diff in other countries the picture could be a little bit different. And finally, the amount of money that we spend on a meal is going, apparently going up. The, there's a bit of seasonality there. Um, so the, uh, the last number here was, was last June. That was Christmas before June, Christmas, June, Christmas. So there's a... Uh, a seasonality, the amount of money we spend at Christmas is slightly more than the amount of money we spend before, uh, uh, in the summer. Um, but, and bearing in mind, we've got inflation and um, uh, over that period it was sort of about 2% a year. So the amount of money that people were spending per meal was falling. They were eating out more often, or more people were eating out, they are eating out more often, but the amount of money that they spent per meal was falling. And that was because the more the increase in the meals that they were eating out were in cheaper places, so that is a um, that is a, a sign I think of the recovery from the recession. And I said I'm not going to be talking obsessing about the last few years. So just take away the figure that we spend on average around about 12, 13, 14 pounds per meal on average, and that's quite a high number. Okay. Um, if we look at what is driving this industry, and I promise I will start to define it in a minute, but if we look at what is defining it, what is driving it, there are three um, on, the, on the demand side. We are, we've got more money in our pockets longer term. We're, we tend to be richer. And more money means that we can do more things with it like eating out. We have more time, as I said before, but the, the food service industry has got to fight for its place in the sun. And we're now, now uh, unlike, say, 20 or 30 years ago, eating out is something that we naturally do. It's very difficult to remember. Um, certainly, I can remember uh, when I was young, um, we went out twice a year, once at Christmas and once on my birthday, and that was it. Um, Nowadays, we eat out as a matter of course. So those are demand drivers. The consumer wants to eat out more. It wants to do lots of other things, but wants to eat out more. And on the supply side, and uh, immensely important in London at the, at the moment, is the growing choice of places to eat. Um, what we're seeing in London is a phenomenal, um, phenomenal uh, change and phenomenal boom. And I'm saying that not only because I'm here, but I hear it from all, the, all my clients from around the world. Um, so, the, the consumer has a whole range of different requirements which impinge on where they eat, what they choose to eat, uh, in a sense how much they're going to pay. Um, they're eating out more, they're eating out, probably eating, I don't know, you can tell me, eating more at home and they're having stuff delivered to their home, either by Tesco, which they warm up if it's a pizza, or they have it delivered 
buy Domino's and eat it at home. So home eating uh, is important, eating out is also important. Um, and overall, the customer wants to spend less per meal. And that's been a big driver. And I think this coming year is going to be particularly significant with the inflation now at, at zero and um, over, over the year as a whole, probably no inflation in the market. Customers not wanting to spend a penny more than they spent before, but expecting to eat better. And better food, better choice, more innovation, uh, and um, more um, and better service. So that's my take on the consumer insofar as things that we can talk about. I mean, we, we can talk about the consumer forever, but I think that's important for the industry now. Okay? So, Promised, I promised we would talk about the industry. So this is the industry. Uh, and I'm going to go into a little bit more detail in each of these in a minute. But restaurants are places where you go and you go in, you sit down, you get served by a waiter or a waitress, you probably, or well, you have the choice of alcohol, you probably don't, you may not consume it, um, and you pay at the end of a meal. That's a restaurant and it covers everything from really high-end dining down to um, Ed's Easy Diner, um, 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 an Indian takeaway, whatever. Sorry, an Indian restaurant, a uh, Chinese restaurant, whatever. That's, that's what a restaurant is. Quick service is um, typically where you don't have alcohol, where you um, probably get served at a counter somewhere, you have the option of taking it away. You may not, but you have the option of taking it away. And you probably pay for it before you've eaten it. Um, we include in this the takeaway, the, the home delivery piece as well. Um, I haven't mentioned uh, eating in a spa. I haven't mentioned eating in uh, Marks & Spencer. If you eat a meal or have a coffee in Marks & Spencer or at a spa, it's included in those figures. Um, so um, Marks and Spencer in-store restaurant is a restaurant. Um, um, a spa where you can have the food um, microwaved uh, to eat and take away is included in quick service. We don't include what comes out of motorway service area, um, uh, out of petrol stations, but out of motorway service areas, they will be included in here. Um, is that sort of answering your question? Yeah, I'm happy to argue about it, and we can we can discuss it. Um, pubs are places which serve but primarily serve alcohol, and in fact, if uh, in our definition, if a pub serves, uh, if more than fifty percent of its income comes from food, we then put it in restaurants. Um, big debate with the. Uh, uh, pub industry about whether we should do that or not, but that's what we do as a, in our standard definitions, but our, our numbers are organised in such a way we can actually take them out of restaurants and put them into pubs if you want. So a pub s primarily serves alcohol, but increasingly serves food. And a hotel may be a five-star hotel or seven-star hotel if you go to Dubai, um, or it may be just a bit bed and breakfast or a farm that is offering overnight accommodation. The leisure market is all sorts of things like um, sports clubs and so on. Staff catering is catering at work. Um, healthcare is um, hospitals, care homes, and that sort of thing, uh, and including the canteen that goes on in a hospital, um, which is quite a significant part of the total food offer in a hospital. It's about, um, about a quarter. Um, education is primary schools, secondary schools, um, universities, further education, higher education, anything where people are being educated. And then what we call services, which is actually a small market, which is what the Americans call correctional, what we call prisons, um, the military, meals on wheels, and so on. So that is the industry, and serving it as an element of it is our people who um, run a food service offer in um, a, a place of work or 
here probably, um, they are not, um, city university don't do their own catering, there's an external caterer and those are contract caterers and they work primarily in, in the bottom half of the table. So that is the industry uh, in some sort of nutshell and if we just investigate just a little bit more. Am I doing all right? Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Nobody, I'm not getting many questions, so I'm either, I'm either got it right or I've got it wrong. That's what, yes, we have, a, we have a question. Um, there's been like lots of debate on hospital meals and school meals not being nutritious and, um, or improving them at least. And do you think that the fact that they bring in um, caters from external sources has any impact on food quality because it was interesting that all of those were in the bottom section yeah. and not in the top. Um, well, uh, I think the, simp the simple answer is probably not because I think one of, the, one of the reasons it seems to me that the drivers on quality are um, price and cost, the amount of money available uh, to, to buy whatever is required um, there is the demand bit. I want to have chips with my pizza, so, you know, that's what I'm going to get. Um, and I don't think the contract caterers actually um, add to the problem. Um, in some senses, they may subtract from it because they've got a, they've got a hinterland of... of um, being able to buy very effectively of, of experience in, in running operations that don't waste uh, food and so on. So um, I, I, there is an argument that says these guys are, are driven by profit and therefore whatever they do is going to be um, not necessarily in the interest of the consumer, but I think overall they probably do quite a good job. And, um, that's what I would say. Yeah. Uh, just to chip in, Peter, and I, I think it's picking up from the, the Irish guys. So this sort of converging between food retail and, and, and food service, and you know, if you take, say, a 7-Eleven globally, which mm. is increasingly a direct competitor of, say, a McDonald's, yep. how, how, how do you sort of build that into your... How do we build it into our model, yeah. into our view of the model? Well, we comment on it, but we, and we acknowledge it, and we sometimes measure it, but we don't consider the, okay, so that, that side is definitely food service. A restaurant is definitely food service. And Sainsbury's selling whatever it is, is definitely retail. And then there's this bit in the middle. Um, and we just have cutoff points, basically. And we say that is retail and that is food service. A good example is in the quick service segment of sandwiches. So we say Pret-a-Manger is a quick service outlet. Um, you can buy a very similar product from Tesco and we say that is retail. Th that's just the way that we look at it. We acknowledge that there is this blurring and there are other aspects, uh, uh, other reasons for blurring. But um, from where I come from, in a, in a commercial sense, that's, all, that's the way we look at it. And that's how most people that, I, that we deal with, so food suppliers and operators and so on, actually view it as well. Because they're looking at the outlet rather than the consumer experience, is what I understood. Um, pro questions. Yeah, pro probably, yes. Yeah. Tony. Tony Allen, thank you. This is excellent, <laughs> wonderful. Oh, um, good. <laughs> so, we haven't started yet. <laughs> Just in case you don't say anything about it, I'm fascinated by how underpriced food tends to be. So cheap yes. food is an obsession of politicians and some other people that pretend and so on. So are you going to say anything about cheap food or properly priced food? Uh, yeah, yeah, I am. I will. Good. I promise. I that will. That back to the question of profitability. I don't want to let you go with that. Okay. Okay. Fine. <coughs> okay, so restaurants here, uh, they account for around about 11% um, of all outlets in the UK. So Often people, if they talk about the industry, if they don't know anything about it, they'll say, yeah, it's restaurants, but actually it's only 11% of all outlets are what I defined before as restaurants. Um, <clears throat> and they serve about 9% of all meals. So the average throughput is slightly below the average for the industry as a whole. 
Um, there are a number of chains that you'd know about, obviously, uh, Nando's and Pizza Express, down through Wagamama and Bills and Coat. And, and then there are an awful lot of emerging brands that uh, they may only have three or four and you can easily go for weeks or months and not notice them. Um, but they are, they are growing and they are emerging. There are brands like, uh, I don't know, um, uh, Turtle Bay or Las Iguanas, which are out, you know, live outside London primarily. Um, so there's a lot, a lot of smaller emerging brands giving an awful lot of dynamism to this industry at the moment. Um, so I'm going to flick through, but if you want me to stop, stick your hand up. Okay, so quick service is uh, everything from fish and chip shops through to McDonald's. Um, it's around about 33,000 outlets, 13% of all outlets, but 26% of all meals. So the volume is great. Uh, um, the pricing, uh, in, in terms of its share of price, it's less, but um, it, there, there is a big volume going through these places. Um, because that's the way you generate your profit. Uh, small, small unit profit um, as, you, as you drive through the industry, serve a lot of meals and, you, and your profits go up. However, that applies to Domino's and McDonald's. Fish and chip shops, a lot of the ethnic market is, is a different kettle of fish and it's much more um, uh, a subsistence business. In other words, the profits are quite small and you can live on what is left in the till at the end of the week rather than uh, creating a sustainable business. So in this sector there are a lot of marginal businesses. Um, <coughs> the Americans have dominated this market for many years, so um, uh, Burger King, Subway, um, Starbucks and so on, but we've got Pret-a-Manger, we've got Costa uh, and, and a few other larger uh, UK chains as well, but it's where the Americans work and it's driven out of the States because that is the big, big market in the States. I mean, what is interesting, over here we've got two big burger chains. Uh, in the States they've got something like 35 to 40. Um, so, and all the burger chains are now coming, looking at the UK. Five Guys, Fat Burger, Smash Burger, you name it, they're all looking here. Um, pubs, um, I've talked about pubs a little bit. Um, the important thing about this industry is that pubs historically have, have um, existed on supplying beer. Um, that's, that was their original rationale. Beer sales are falling. Beer, beer consumes a lot of water. I got water in, I knew I'd mention it. Um, beer, beer uses a lot of uh, water. Um, Beer sales are falling, they're falling across Europe um, and they're certainly um, falling at such a rate that uh, they're causing the whole pub sector to reduce its, no volume, it, its numbers of outlets because of huge overcapacity. So um, about 15 years ago there were 60,000 pubs, there are now um, about 45,000 pubs. Um, and if it hadn't been for food, that number would be even less. Food has come along and has allowed pubs to partly replace um, alcohol with food. Um, there, hasn't, there isn't enough demand for food um, to manage, uh, to bridge the gap of, of the lost profit on the alcohol, declining alcohol sales. But, um, uh, so that, <coughs> that has led to closures of pubs but it's, whole, it's slowed the closure rate down. I think there's quite a lot of, of um, way to go until the industry has, has reached bottom, but it's doing a very, very good job when it comes to food. And that's because it's got um, a number of income streams, at least two. One income stream is, is alcohol, albeit declining, and another one is food. So you're not, as an operator, you're not totally dependent on serving food, whereas if you're running a restaurant, you are. So the pub sector has got quite a number of advantages over food, that being one. And another one is that they are in, they're well sited. They've often got a car park, which is important. Uh, they've got um, um, 
often quite a large footprint, so you can put in a decent sized restaurant and have a, uh, a, a reasonable kitchen area and so on. So the pub sector has got a lot going for it. It's a bit of a newcomer to the food service industry, although pubs have been serving food now for the best part of 30 years. Um, but it's, um, it's a bit of a newcomer and it's likely, in my view, to continue to disrupt the industry uh, over the next few years because of its just need to serve more food. Um, so that's the pub sector. Um, the hotels cover everything from the largest uh, five-star hotels, two, three, four hundred rooms, right down to your B&B, &B, which may be only open three months in the year and just serving breakfast, or may have been commandeered by the local um, 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 local council to, to serve um, uh, um, homeless people and so on. So it is a very big industry, but most of it is concentrated in that top bit, the large, the large hotels. Um, there are 45,000 of these places, but actually probably only about four or 5,000 are of any significant size. And of course, in, in a hotel, it's quite interesting because they're not just serving food to people who walk in off the street. In fact, they're serving very little of that. They are serving breakfast. About half of all meals served in hotels is breakfast. They are serving conferences. They're doing room service and so on. So they have a, a lot of different issues to cope with. Um, the leisure market um, sort of listed out things at the top. The visitor attractions, um, entertainment, uh, cinema, bingo, that sort of thing sports and social clubs, event catering, mobile catering, and catering on board trains and boats and planes. We've included them here. Um, so this is a very varied industry, very, very varied sector, um, where the food is maybe given away, like on, a, on a, an airline, um, not, not a budget airline, because they sell, sell food, but um, uh, your traditional airline will be giving food away as part of the all-in package. Um, um, uh, but, uh, and on the other hand, there are uh, outlets that are, are ch charging quite high, hefty prices. If you go to Wembley, Wembley Stadium or um, Manchester United, you can pay a lot of money for a meal there. So this, vary, this is a very varied segment, um, which most of, uh, most, actually most suppliers find very difficult to understand. And then there's staff catering, which is a big segment, 7% of all outlets, but 10% of all meals. Um, th there are around about just under 18,000 outlets, but we count in the staff catering. Uh, people in this country, there are about a million or so workplaces, but the vast majority of them don't have any, any facility for catering other than a, a kettle and a spoon. So, um, out, uh, business uh, uh, premises and local and national government offices have around about, uh, about 18,000 canteens serving people every day. So um, where, where these people are different from most of the other sectors that we look at, you've got the same people coming in uh, every day or, or frequently to, um, to um, take food. And it's in this sort of place, I think, that the operator has, an, has a, some sort of responsibility to serve um, healthy, nutritious food. Uh, if you, go, if you, you, know, you want to spend 20, 30, 40, 50 pounds on a meal and it's fattening and bad for you, well, that's fine because you're not going to be doing it every day. Um, but if you go and eat at work and it's fattening and, and unhealthy, then that's not good for you. So I think there are, um, there's some sort of responsibility that these places have to, to, the, to the customer. Um, interestingly, although there are more people at work, there are fewer people working in workplaces, home working, part-time working, that sort of thing, or out on the road. Um, and these, so the actual demand for feeding at work is declining, although more and more people are at work. Um, healthcare, which is care homes uh, and, uh, include, uh, and hospitals, and it includes the uh, NHS and local authorities, but also private. Um, 
is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a big market, 13% um, of all meals, um, where costs are, are hugely important. Although the health budget, and this is where I'm stepping into the area of politics now, um, the, um, the budget for the NHS has been ring-fenced. Um, I understand that that doesn't actually mean um, the amount of pounds available are the same. It's just that um, it's not being trickled off into other areas. But more importantly, um, the, because the amount of money is not growing at the same rate as the demand for the basic healthcare services, that those healthcare services have to find some additional money from somewhere, and one of it is, comes from, provide, from the food provision. So we're finding that all sorts of things are being done so that actually less food is being served. Um, so what, what you can do is you can send your patients home before they have their breakfast. So you don't have to serve them breakfast. You then don't need to take in the next patient until the evening. So you save breakfast and lunch, and if you're lucky, you save them tea and supper as well. That's additional money that can then be used for primary health care. I'm being a little bit cynical, but those are things that are happening. Um, and the contract caterers work in this market. They are um, quite important in the bigger places. They're not at all important in the smaller places. And then there's education. The big news in the education sector is free school meals for the first three years at school, which was introduced last autumn. So that's going to increase demand for food in this sector. Uh, or it has done, and um, um, uh, so there's more, de more demand for food. There's children being fed who weren't being fed at school. Um, the hope would be that they are um, being fed healthy, nutritious food and that, that they will benefit from it. Um, I'm not gonna, I really don't know whether that is an outcome or not, but I, that is part of, part of the uh, um, a desired outcome anyway. Um, and then finally, there's this relatively small segment of fire police, etc., etc., uh, which is quite specialised. Uh, I've got very specialised components. Um, the prison service has to feed people on about one pound fifty a day, uh, which is very difficult. Very difficult. But they do have um, their own farms. Or not all of them, but they do have access to f food in that way. Um, um, and they, you know, they'll, they'll tend to buy the cheaper food, cheapest food that they can. So that's a run through of the nine sectors of the market. Is there any, anything anybody wants to explore with me on that? Well, we I'm surprised you had so few under education. Few what? 24, well you've got 3,260 uh, outlets. That's a mistake. It should be... And it's more like 35,260. Right. Yeah, okay. Thank you for that. I, I shall remember. Uh, I've given this presentation three times in the last, well, not, not this one, but I've shown this chart three times in the past month. Nobody's questioned me. So, so thank you. It's, a, it's around about 35,000, yeah. Um, and primary schools are, are the largest number, um, but they... Uh, Yes. Sense, so they're rating the food budget to pay for other things in the school. So there's yep. a real problem, which is sort of what you were saying about the healthcare. The healthcare. Yes. The whole sector robbing itself. Abs know, absolutely, know. absolutely, and uh, um, it wouldn't matter if if um, the food that people are getting generally in, from other sources was very acceptable, but. But it isn't. So school meals and, and uh, obviously if you're in a hospital, being fed the food, and you may be in hospital for a few days, you've actually got to have good food all the time. Any other questions? Okay. Are you, I, I, do you want to open it up? Or? 
Uh, well, I got loads more, loads more. So if, you, if you're dying here and you'd really like to talk about Manchester United or something, no. I'm happy I'm up for that. No, anything but Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I mean, I'm, I'm interested, I would like to ask, I'm interested in the general picture you're giving <coughs> is of a squeeze. Yeah. A huge industry but being squeezed. Is that the picture everyone else is getting? And for me, the, the big question is, is the squeeze on small businesses? Is What's the picture of okay. big businesses? Is it in, in some of the, your nine sectors, there's high degrees of concentration? No. Uh, are you moving forward? Yeah. I'm, what I'm are the dynamics is what I want to okay. You've given so, a lovely picture okay. of what are the dynamics. Okay, fine. Okay. So, um, Sorry, uh, good. I'll, I'll come. I'll come on to that. So, j just but just to finish, and this is taking contract caterers from a number of different sectors and bunging them all together. This is where the big boys live: uh, Compass and Sodexo, companies you've heard of, maybe. Uh, then there are others, not quite so big, but still big, um, and they. Uh, they're, they're big companies um, serving 17% of all meals, um, very varied, um, and they, they have the opportunity to influence a lot of what happens in the, um, in the bottom half of that uh, table that I showed you before. Yeah. That's not true. You go to the city, Google are offering for their staff free meals. A number of big operators in the city, not that far, say this is a premium we are prepared to pay for people who are earning a lot. Yeah. And actually the food is very Pretty good. good. Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Welcome to do exactly the same thing. You're welcome to us. Okay, so, so we've seen this reversal. That's a good point. From people being subsidized to people, now we're subsidizing the rich, you know. Yeah, okay. So we're going to man the barricades. Um, but, I, but I, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, and um, where, where the people who need the food and need the subsidised food are being fed by people, and here I'm talking fed by the government, uh, by people who don't necessarily value what it actually means to be fed and to be fed well, whereas Google does. So it's worthwhile finding the money from the profits to pay for it. Where it and it's not worthwhile finding the money from taxation to pay for it in schools. So it's a very good point. And it's also the staff. The staff here tell us they now can't have free, the, the catering staff don't have free meals. No. They no. work in, and they don't, whereas Absolutely. 20 years ago, they would have. You know, that yeah. would have been just a part of the routine. Yeah. But, uh, that is um, because the, the margins are so tight that, that there is nothing left to feed some chips to the, the, the waiting staff. I'm going to tip on there, press on, because you're Go, getting okay. us going. Um, okay. The okay. issue there, that I, for me, Martin's raising, is this is an industry that is known for low wages. So yes. we've got a squeezed market, low wages, some ends, Google, you know, is a huge social benefit in that. A very smart operation. I've been around it, all bits of it. But so, what, what are you going to tell us anything about the, the labour side? Because um, you had your third... Well, third I, I, third. I had a chart about labour, and yeah, OK, so I should have mentioned then the, the, this issue about labour. There is a... Uh, the industry employs about one and a half million people, so it is a large employer in this country. It's the biggest employer. Uh, probably. Well, it bigger is. than the NHS, I don't know. Anyway, it is a big employer, w one and a half million people. Um, the level of training needed to wash a dish is not very high. Uh, as you go up, there is greater demand for ex experience and, and qualifications. But overall, there is, um, it, can, uh, um, it can be populated by people who are not very well trained and those would tend to be people who want, want a job. Uh, so there's constant um, um, competition for jobs, which reduces price. At the same time, the industry is very, very competitive. Uh, 
barriers to entry to becoming a restaurant or quick service outlet are very low um, for an individual outlet. So yeah, there, there's a go bust every year. Yes. So the industry is very competitive, which means it can't afford to pay a lot. And it's got a ready supply of people who are prepared to work in it for not a lot. And that's what keeps the industry going. And it's not only in this country, it's in America, because if you work in America as a waiter, you don't get paid. No, you just live off your tips. So um, it is in, it's endemic in the industry, it's a low paid um, issue. And, and I, I hear all sorts of things, you know, conferences and talking about it and what we can do about it. But the, the reality is, it's probably very, very difficult to do anything other than pay people quite a low wage. Offsetting that is that it's a great industry to be in um, and, and it's great fun and, and at above a certain level and you don't need to be very high, you can actually really enjoy it. You work very hard but really enjoy it. Um, uh, uh, there is the opportunity to become Jamie Oliver. Um, um, the, the, there's lots of things going for it, but the reality is it's very tough. Sorry? Okay. Not a living wage. Did you want to come in on this point? Um, no, no, Peter slightly again. different, but just on the... Uh, Sorry. Sorry, I'll let him not have it because he's right next to a microphone on the camera. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, sort of linked to your last comment about the um, sort of having fun in the business and whatnot. Is there sort of um, sort of an urban element to sort of the food industry? And where do things like sort of um, street food or, or supper yeah. clubs okay. or sort of underground dining or even um, sort of retail, not food retail, but let's say a clothes shop having a cafe? Yeah, Burberry. Know, yeah, how, how do those fit in? Okay. And is it like a very London well, specific? Or? This is sort of a beginning to address um, uh, Tim's point as well. Okay. So, so I've, got some, I've got some charts here and I'll, I'll talk off them. This one summarizes the numbers of meals. Uh, quick service is big. Um, so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not deliberately not answering this question, uh, um, I, but I'm going to get to it. This looks at the food purchases. So this is how much the industry spends on food. Where is it spent? It's spent in restaurants, quick service and pubs, quite a bit in hotels. Um, so there's a lot of meals served down this end, but the money gets spent down that end. Um, so, and why is that? It's because this is where the successful businesses live. Not, they're not all successful, but they live here. Um, hotels don't really want to be in the, in the food business um, because their job is selling bed nights. So they don't want to serve food at all, um, but they have to. Um, so it's here where you've got all the exciting bits, um, which can be, um, um, a branded restaurant chain. I, I've mentioned some before, like Nando's or Ask or Wagamama. Um, and they are uh, developing and expanding and they can afford to have um, training programs. Um, they need to keep people. They need to reduce staff churn uh, because um, that way you, they retain uh, management expertise. They can... And, it's cheaper to keep somebody than to recruit somebody new. So there's a lot going for the branded, the larger operators in the restaurant sector. Um, in, amongst the independent bit and, and to this other point about um, street food and pop-ups and so on, in London in particular, it is um, almost expected. It, it, it is very easy to set up. A, uh, a street food business because the customers don't need to be educated about what it is. They just see it, they go there and they buy food from it. Um, and there are, uh, lot, there are opportunities for growing a business being quite small. A, a lot of street food businesses are small um, and maybe are, are trying out a concept which is going to become a bigger concept, so you get a street food concept featuring, I, I don't know, um, food from a particular country, customers like it, they like the price point, 
The next step is then to say, how can I turn this into a bricks and mortar building uh, operation? Um, that's actually very difficult because one of the advantages of street food is that the costs are relatively low. Turning it into a building, your costs go up, and so all, all the economies go, go haywire. But some people have done it. Franco Manka, for instance. Um, so there, um, th there is a lot of activity going on here in restaurants, particularly in London, but not only in London. Bristol um, has got quite a lot of, of developments going on. Manchester, the Spinning Fields area in North Manchester. Um, uh, Leeds, um, the, the Trinity Shopping Centre in Leeds has led to a whole um, um, I expansion in um, thinking about serving restaurants in areas wh which uh, previously didn't have them. Um, the quick service area, we've got a lot of food to go offers. Again, again in London, uh, Avocado, um, Itsu, Wasabi, um, all doing f uh, phenomenally well, um, growing at, you know, in, um, five, six, seven, ten percent a year, some of these places, in this quick service area. At the same time, you've got a lot of independents that have been running for donkey's years, uh, fish and chip shops, um, um, small sandwich bars and so on, which are suffering. And then there's the whole pub sector that I mentioned before, which divides into two, conveniently. There are pubs which are managed by the people who own an estate, a number of pubs, they'll manage a pub and they'll do it well, by and large, the companies like Weatherspoons, uh, Mitchells and Butlers with the All Bar One and O'Neill's and so on. And then the other side of it is the tenanted business. So if you, there are, there are companies that own large estates of pubs, companies like Punch Enterprise, who own several thousand pubs, but they don't run any of them. They just um, have tenants who pay them a, pay them a rent uh, and run it. And the tenants are not really up to, as a class, aren't up to the task of taking on the restaurants and the quick service people. And if you go back to the point that I mentioned before about the pub sector losing its beer sales, if you're not able to replace your lost beer sales with food, you're done for. And that's what's happening in the, in the tenanted sector. The managed sector is doing all right. <coughs> so, yeah. <coughs> Uh, what are the consequences of this increasing amount of meals being bought in the food service sector, especially QSR, for public health? Do you have uh, any ID? Or uh, is it not your expertise, you would say? Well, it's not really my expertise, but I would say if you're an, oper if, if you're an operator from here down to here, mm -hmm. you don't care. Okay? You don't really care with one caveat so okay so you'll you'll serve what the customer wants mm -hmm. at the moment there is a a uh, it's a good thing to be served to, to be seen to be serving allergen free apart from the fact that you you know the law says you've got to tell people about it allergen free particularly gluten free um, i think 30 percent of menus from the larger chains make a feature of mentioning allergen uh, gluten free um, if it's healthy, if you can say it's healthy, that sounds good, even if it isn't, or even if not many people buy that option. Um, if, it's, if it's local, um, local doesn't necessarily mean nearby, incidentally. I, we, I spoke to a cafe owner who said that um, all, all, he bought all his food locally within five miles. Uh, it sounded very impressive until he told me who bought from a local cash and carry. Um, you know, local can mean anywhere in the, in the British Isles, uh, or it may be, you know, m m closer than that. Um, Is that answering your question? Um, now, if I can then ask a second question, um, should they care? Is that the responsibility then of QSR, pubs, hotel, leisure, yeah, to say... I knew somebody was going to ask me this yeah, question. Yeah, of course. Um, That's I, I, a tremendous absolutely. debate, of course, going on. But should, should these people care? Well, they're, they're in business. As long as the customers don't die off, as long as the customers keep coming in, they shouldn't care. However, they are also human beings. Uh, they may have shareholders who have some sort of 
um, social responsibility, code of social responsibility. So I, th I think everybody should care about this sort of thing. But if you can serve a quadruple burger with chips and cheese and it's four and a half thousand calories and people want to pay for it, you know, as long as they don't eat it morning, noon and night, what does it matter? Can I add to your question? Your right hand of your slide there, Peter, is the contracting sector. Well, par partly, partly, partly. They're broadly, big here, they're less important yeah. here, yeah. Uh, broadly, it's the indulgence area on the, the other end. end. Yeah, yeah. They've got the most money in the cash flow and are spending most, but the bits which are more associated with the public good, yeah. your, your question, I forget your name, your, your question about public health. That is a paradox which I think is, in public policy terms, is a really important one. Politicians spend all their time focusing on that right-hand set. Yeah. Actually, they're doing absolutely nothing to think about public health, yeah. or, or indeed the environment, on the left-hand side. It, it that's seem, a really interesting thing. It seems to me that public health initiatives are focused on, on 20 companies in this space here because it's easy to identify McDonald's, Pizza Hut, KFC and so on. But, but the people, by and large, don't eat in those places very often. So some of the well, the core what? groups were interested to, if you go back to your earlier slide about who eats from places most, it was young men between... Yeah, yeah. And they actually are of concern to us in public health and different ethnic groups. Okay. But, but the one initiative is about labelling information. Yes. It's on a voluntary basis, but um, it, uh, it, it's potential. It, it's not voluntary. It's it's mandated. Well, for for, for the calorie labelling. The, the calorie labelling. Sorry, I thought I thought we were talking about allergen labelling. No, no. Well, uh, you know, just giving the basic, you know. Yeah. Uh, calories and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and that has the potential to be made a statutory obligation sure. to be spread. I mean, at the moment, the obligation is only on, la on large operators. Yeah. And uh, uh, it's only a small gesture, um, but it, 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 it would be significant. And there's also an incentive on sourcing, and a few operators do make a point of selling organic right. or sustainable fish or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's all done in small, small bits, and I can point to any, any menu produced by any of the big operators that talks about healthy and talks about local sourcing and all the good things, but customers don't buy it. So, you know, um, the operator will then say, well, you know, I've got it there, but nobody buys it, so I'm really not going to push it. Um, I'm, so I'm not, I don't know if I'm responding or answering your question, but that's my thought on it. Well, I don't see how you can answer the question, actually. I'm not saying that in your defence, uh, because it's a public policy issue. It's one that the industry hasn't stepped up to, uh, but nor has it come under any pressure, well, except in certain little slots. A bit of staff catering and education and a bit of rhetoric about the QSR and public health. Basically, but the food service sector doesn't come under any pressure, really. Not well, compared to retailing or no, farming. No, no, no. Um, I, I, but it should and could come under yeah, pressure. I thought that oh. was your point, and that's yeah. Martin's point. Okay. I thought that was your point. Yes, it is, yes. Okay. Okay, so we've got well, five people agreeing. Because you can put small businesses out of operation and just leave the left hand side. I mean, McDonald's, KFC are doing all of that. You know, they're not, yes. doing, not, not doing calories, but they're doing. Lots of they, they are doing yeah, calories if you, you can't. We work in local areas, is we can clear the field, and all that comes in is McDonald's and KFC, and you rule out all those small operators yeah. who go bust maybe every year. But it is a stepping stone for yeah. lots of people. Well, I, I agree. Yeah. I think that's a really important. So it's you, what are you so suggesting using framework. McDonald's as, as the example and as a driver for the rest of the industry? Is that? Well, if we, if we took, let, let's take a totally different area. If we had someone from animal welfare here, they would they lionise McDonald's. They think yeah. McDonald's is absolutely the best company ever because it has the toughest standards, the clearest auditing, the best accountancy, the best ratcheting up and proper consultation on animal welfare and meat production. McDonald's. Now go to public health and it's almost kind of an inverse, although sometimes wrongly. What we haven't got is a framework 
I think that's what I think hearing you talk, I'm thinking well, that's what we've got. This is such a fragmented industry. This, this, this is 250,000 um, outlets yeah. and 180,000 businesses. And that 1.5 million workers. And 1.5 million Issue. workers. And Turning over 47 billion. Yeah. I mean, you're talking about load of micro-businesses yeah, here. Yeah, yeah. And, and there are trade associations who work in the industry, but you've got the British hospitality industry is the biggest one, and they're in staff catering and hotels, and only the biggest ones. Um, there's the ALMR, which deals in this sector and, and so on. But, the, but there is no... People working in staff catering as a contract caterer don't consider themselves to be working in the same industry as the pub, pub yeah, sector. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it is, one way of looking at it is it's actually nine sectors and not one. And even within these sectors, there are subsectors. Uh, we're, we're getting conversation going. Are you happy with this or have you got... I've got loads more, but I, don't, I want to be driven by the audience yeah, rather than what I have to say. Good. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank well, you. Very good. Very good. I, I happy to open it up and yeah. get, uh, Peter to I've I've, I've got a few charts to, at the end, which if we have five minutes, I'd just like to go through just to look at where where it's going. Half an hour, so okay. Fine, okay. I I just thought it would be useful to mention one system that covers everything and retail as well, which is the the, the food safety. System. Yes, the food, yeah, yeah. The food centers yeah. agency start on the door system, um, which perhaps, um, which has great potential if, um, if consumers get more used to it and could put a lot of pressure. And food safety overall is the first requirement for healthy nutrition. Uh, one, one of the things, I, I wouldn't say against so that. start on door scheme? I think some people won't. Okay, to well, it's... Um, they, I, I'm not an expert in it at all. Miriam probably knows more than I do. Um, but <coughs> um, you get inspected by health and safety and, and food, uh, uh, food safety. Environmental. Environmental, that's it, that's it. So I said I didn't know very much. And depending on how well you do, you get a score and you convert that into a star and you stick the stars on your doors. If you've got five stars, great. If you've got no stars, not so good. Probably don't stick them on the doors. You, you don't stick them on the doors. Um, and they're quite widely available, yeah. but actually how many people are aware of it? It, it needs an yeah. So, So out of this room of reasonably well-educated people, a handful are aware of it. So that, that's part of the problem. Um, so m tell more people about it, absolutely. But I think one of the other issues is, is a softer one, and that is that when people go out to eat, in a sense, they just want to be, feel comfortable. They don't want to feel that it's marked up and it's qualified, and they just want to go out and enjoy it. So, in a sense, it's not part of the mindset when people eat out. And I think that is a part of... Uh, until they get food poisoning. Yeah, yeah. Do you want to come in? Um, I also have a sort of the Sustainable Restaurants um, Association. Yeah, yeah. I know that there was an article recently about how you had to have society and service and treating your staff well, especially if you are sourcing local food and all of this. And they also, maybe that could be like a framework, and they're also promoting cooking as well, like cooking lessons alongside the restaurant and that educational aspect. And I just wanted to know how much you knew about that. And that is a well, holistic framework. I don't, I, can't, I don't know how much I know about it. I know, I know a bit about <laughs> it. I think, what, but, what, but again, the Sustainable Restaurant Association works down here. And Bridging with education, and they're then incorporating yeah. and then kids could yeah. be like, "Oh, I want better school meals." It's it's because it is a fragmented industry, and there's a lot that needs to be done. Um, the only way things are going to happen is by making connections and getting the consumer to drive it forward. And the consumer isn't going to drive it forward unless they're engaged, unless it's important to them. So. This business about, um, for instance, I mentioned um, gluten-free and um, f uh, food for celiacs. That has mushroomed um, out of all proportion of the number of people who are celiacs. Um, 
merely because, well, not merely, but because the consumer has engaged with it and the operator has seen this as important. Um, that's not my, my interpretation, actually. I, I think that's right. I think it's because it's doable. It's because it's doable. It's doable. Yeah. It's and a question you're raising um, about sustainability and what the SRA is trying to do is much bigger. It's yeah. wanting a different food system. Uh, and that's, that's where the framework is yeah. Come, well, comes, comes here. But funnily enough, there's actually there's talk now, I'm involved in it, of whether we shift the stars on doors, I should tell you this, Peter, um, uh, into sustainability stars on doors. Given the food service industry is so huge and providing 30% of all the food but, you see. But op operators down here. They have a huge operate, Operators now. here have, have some incentive to talk about these sort of issues. To do so. But not all of them, but a lot of them have the incentive. In this sector, very little. In this sector, a few. And then beyond it, it, it becomes less important, although down here it should be important. So, um, and that's, it's a function, uh, I'm a defeatist, I think, in, in, in this whole area that we're talking about, so I'm a defeatist. A realist, we're probably being wild well, possibly. You've got this fragmentation and you've got, you've got some places that um, trade on their indulgent image and you've got other people that trade on their healthy and care for the environment. You know, Leon versus Nando's are two different, you know, living on different planets and yet they're in the same sector. So actually getting them all to be, or getting them generally to be talking the same language is very difficult. I th to my, in my yeah, mind. Interestingly, Leon from here has had a vast effect on that. Yeah, yeah. And they wrote the report. Sorry. So Just following on from what you were saying, what are some of the incentives that restaurants have to engage in discussions? About, about uh, these things? Yeah. None at all. Why should they? Yeah. You were just saying they, they have some incentives. Well, OK. OK, so if you're opening a restaurant and you want to appeal to this class of person, whatever it is, and this class of person is concerned about sustainability, then you talk sustainability and they'll come and flock to your doors. That's what I mean by having an interest. So I'm, I'm being quite, I've possibly cynical, um, Tim would be kind of say I'm being realist, but, you know, it's, it's about what makes sense to my business in, in, in a terms of attracting customer. So there are some, some there's quite a lot of businesses. I'm, I'm not sure, I've got, I've got some charts. If we get to them, we can look at them about, about, about what's covered. Should, I'll flick through if I may, because this might. Yeah, why don't we flick through? Should we, should we do a moratorium No. Okay, so this is based on an analysis of 130 or menus from 130 chains, the big ones, and we we just monitor what is mentioned on the me on the menu. So that's all. Um, and the very what we call ethical um, issues. So homemade is the most important. It's not an ethical issue, but it's, it, it, that is. That's the important thing that appeals to customers. Then we got a bit of free range. Then a big drop, an organic, sustainable, farm assured, local, line court, etc. So the, these things are not important to the majority of restaurateurs, or pub, pub operators, quick service outlets. What is important is homemade. Okay? Um, and that's the reality. That's where they are. They may, they may claim to be only um, f serving corn-fed, well, that's probably not a, an ethical issue, uh, uh, on, on uh, you know, farm-assured food. They may claim that this is important to them, but the reality is it, it doesn't really matter too much. And it's a similar picture when it comes to issues around um, health, uh, Calories and that sort of thing. Just how do they define homemade in, in a very large... Yeah, well, okay. <laughs> yeah. Dr. Shan said, how do they define homemade? Yeah, I know. Um, well, uh, again, I can be cynical the other way now. 
Um, uh, you, buy, you buy a can of soup, you buy a can of soup and you sprinkle some celery on the top and it becomes homemade. Yeah? <laughs> so to me, uh, the homemade um, sounds like it's uh, it provides like a like a little bit of safety for the customer. So he doesn't have to deal with stars or numbers on, yeah. on the box or, or something. And um, I just thought about in Germany, there's a lot of discussion about this uh, free trade agreement with the United States right now. Sure, and sure. Um, exactly. And I think a reason why it gets like a lot of public rejection is exactly that um, people want to call upon their government to kind of make a decision for them so they don't have to uh, deal with stars or something at homemade food, basically. Well, I, th that, I think that, that's a good point because one of the things that people have about going out to eat is that they go to places that they trust that have made these decisions for them. Yeah, I... I yeah. Oh. So it just appears that there's a bit of a black hole when it comes to the restaurant industry is guided by um, they will serve what the consumer wants, they what consumer trends they will provide. Um, however, the consumer does uh, give a certain amount of trust to that retailer to provide food of a good quality standard yeah but yet as you've said people consumers they go out to eat the the food is actually the byproduct of what they're going for which is the experience they want kind of all the choice <coughs> elements to be kind of removed from that just so they have a good time and it appears that the consumer uh, doesn't have the information or the I suppose impetus to demand these um, sustainable <coughs> ethical issues they're expecting the industry to do that. Yeah. And the industry is maybe not focused on that because they're not being forced to do that by the customer. I think a very, very so good analysis. So it's how do you then yeah. tackle that uh, black oh. hole, if you will, yeah. Of, of yeah, yeah I just, uh, absolutely. Um, there, there is trust placed in the industry by the consumer. Um, yeah, on a slightly different topic, if you talk about authentic, this is a big thing at the moment, we want authentic food. Well, how do you know if this Peruvian dish you've just ordered is authentic or not? You don't have a clue. And, but you're relying on the operator to say it's authentic. And if they've found it in Alaska, you don't know. We've done some research in Ireland to say food. And actually, consumers are aware. You know, they're paying 90 pence for a chicken. They don't expect it to be free range. They don't expect it to yeah. be... I mean, and they say, well, we know, we know this isn't, we know this isn't Irish, it's probably come from many continents away, but that's our choice. You know, the consumer yep. is making choices which are not driven by health. People eat out, you know, it's Alan Ward stuff, people eat out for the experience, and they say, food was terrible, but we had a great time. Yeah, yeah, you know, absolutely, food, absolutely. For a lot of people. Yep. The food is almost secondary to, in, in some instances, I'm not talking yep. about the gourmets who go out for experience. For most but people it's, it's the experience of being with friends. Yep, ab absolutely, absolutely. So you can then serve people with, without any calorie content uh, yeah. or, and they, they won't buy it and, you, and on the other hand if it's dripping with fat they will. So that there are, there are elements of, of what you said but there are other elements as well which make, makes the customer always want unhealthy or to eat unhealthy when they eat out. Peter you've got uh 17 minutes before okay. we get thrown out. Okay. You said you had some questions well, you wanted to get to. It was really, I'm not sure that, I'm only halfway through. Uh, <laughs> um, I was going to talk about the retail food service battleground, but I don't know if we need to because I don't. I think probably it might be well, what about it, menu development? Okay, well. Uh, I, what I wanted to briefly say was, if you want to look at growth, this is what's happened. Problem here, recession, really bad for the industry in this country, but we're now recovering. Um, 
Um, there are all sorts of issues here. This is our forecast for what's going to be happening in the coming year. If you want to use the US as your example, and people say to me, well, the US is great. Look, um, this is the growth in the US market. This is the growth in the UK market since 1981. This is sales. This is sales, um, yeah, with 1981 being 100. Um, so UK is rubbish. Uh, however, if you take out population growth, and after all, this is very much determined by population, more people there are, more people are going to eat out, the US drops down like that. And the U UK drops down a bit as well. You put the two together and the UK market's been growing just like the US. Um, that's one, one thing I wanted to say. Um, I could talk about pricing and inflation. Um, this, there's been a squeeze here, I won't go into the detail, but a big squeeze on food service operators' um, balance sheets been trickling along and it's gone up in the last 18 months. So they've... Companies down that end have actually got more money to spend, more money to invest, and generally feeling a bit more comfortable. Um, discounting, which was big when we started measuring it in 1980, sorry, in 2008, down here. Peter, uh, what's discounting in food service? Well, so these are vouchers. So online vouchers generally. Which so five quid off a meal out. A t yeah, or, or, or um, ten pounds for, for two or whatever. 19, uh, December 19, uh, sorry, December 2008 was 100. It's got, it went up and down quite a lot and it's now settling down to, at around about 60. So <coughs> there was a period when operators were using discounting and vouchers and special offers to drive custom in and it was going up and down because business was varying on a month by month basis. What we're seeing now is this discounting, uh, overt discounting, is much less important and it's being hardwired into menus. So menus, average menu prices are cheaper now than they were. Um, I've got some information on key players in case you're interested. All of this is available, isn't it? So I don't, won't go into this be made it. because it gets worse. Can I indulge myself as, uh, as chair? I mean, I'm very interested in this, as you know. When Michael and I first started talking with you, I'm interested in, is this growing? Is concert, are the big getting bigger? Yes. You mentioned the contracting. Yes, they are. They are. Across all nine sectors? Uh, or across uh, the, the, the that, that end, definitely. Um, um, at this end, You've got the contract caterers. The big contract caterers are actually getting smaller. The two big contract caterers are getting, getting smaller. smaller. Their turnover is increasing, but their food service turnover is decreasing. They're doing more uh, in, uh, in security and... Um, um, Universities. No, no, no. The, the, the non-food offer, cleaning, um, security, yeah. and all that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, down that end, the big are getting bigger and are increasing their market share. But there are, there are, as a category, they're getting bigger, but there are more small players, small groups emerging. And new entrants, lots of new yeah, entrants? Yeah, lots of, lots of, in the quick service and in the restaurant sector, lots and lots and lots of new entrants. We, is we monitor, aware of that? It's, it's we, monitor, we monitor brands that have got five to 25 outlets and their outlet number's growing at 20% or more over, th over a three year period. When we looked at it in, um, two years ago, there were uh, um, 95. There are now 143 brands in that category. In the, and uh, half of them are in London. So these are the, okay, that starts at McDonald's there and it comes down to Carluccio's and Jamie's to give you some idea. That's the top 25, although I have excluded from this the contract caterers, so you've got to put them in as well. Um, I treat them differently because they're, 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 um, the way that they account for their turnover is different, but that's roughly where they fit. Um, so McDonald's, Mitchell's and Butler's, Compass all down that end. And then down here you've got... Um, Prezzo, Carluccio's, Jamie's. Um, then beyond that, you've, you've got... A, um, oh, sorry, this is just to demonstrate that there's been a lot of... Act oh, there is lots of activity in terms of changes of ownership, splitting companies up, merging, and so on. And it's going to get more of that. Um, 
this is the next 25. So we come down to uh, lounges and bar and uh, Papa John's isn't, it should be up there actually, there's a mistake, but um, so this is Strada, etc. down here. This is the top 50. And then we've got the ones to watch, um, um, the, the growing ones that I mentioned before. So this is uh, October 2014. We're just about to publish the latest one, so it's going a bit, a bit different. But top of the list in terms of increasing outlet numbers in this category, fuel juice bars, which unless you come from the Midlands, you probably don't know about. Dunkin' Donuts come and gone and are coming back into the country. That's a, that's a calorie level for you. Um, avocado, on the other hand, you can go to Dunkin' Donuts and then go to avocado and you'll, and you'll eat average. On average, you could eat okay. Um, burrito, big, healthy, oh, unhealthy, um, uh, young men, that's that market. Um, and so it's a whole mixture of ostensibly healthy stuff, juice bars, and unhealthy burritos. Um, um, gourmet burgers, um, I don't know why we count Five Guys as a gourmet burger. It, primarily because it's expensive. Um, not because it's anything to do with gourmet. Uh, um, and um, so there's a whole mixture of different types of operations all growing rapidly. And as I said, we've just, uh, latest report, we've identified 143 in this country, which is, th from this is where the next generation of brands is going to come from. What about brands within brands, like, I mean, Tay Barnes, you know, I think of Tay Barnes. Tay Barn, that, okay. Well, we, we would, uh, we've included here uh, in this list, Coast to Coast, which is part of the restaurant group, uh, Frankie and Benny's and Chiquita. So we've included Coast to Coast because they are a brand that's growing. Tay Barnes isn't growing, um, oh, but we would have... We, well, not, not very much. Um, but people are growing from eating. Yeah, OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so there's a whole piece about the operators, but what we're talking about here are the, the, the two columns at the end there. We could do something similar in the pub sector um, because things are happening there as well. Um, and they are beginning to, emerge, beginning to merge with this segment here. Um, so, really, that's it. We can use this as a basis for discussion. Two slides, because you said what we learned before, what we learned about some In short, OK. This is more done from the angle of a supplier. And I'm saying lots of options, which is another way of saying it's hugely fragmented. There are all sorts of things happening in all sorts of different directions. So there's lots of options. There's lots. That's the positive way of looking at it. The negative way of looking at it is so blooming complicated, I couldn't do, possibly do anything with it. OK. Um, the big players are, are too important to ignore. So the McDonald's, the Burger Kings, the Compasses. They're too big to ignore as a supplier, but they're also a route in, because all those companies I just mentioned have got a social um, arm, social responsibility arm to them, which is good PR, and they probably begin to believe their own rhetoric, I suspect. Um, uh, so the big players are big, and, but they're not big like the big players are in the retail market. Um, the, top, the top players here have got a tiny percentage of the total market, top players in, food, in retail. If I tell you that the total food service market spends as much money on food or less money on food than Tesco, that gives you some idea of the relative size of, the, of this market. So you can say, why should we bother about getting messages out through and into the food service market? Well, compared to 100 years ago, it's astonishing that there has been such concentration. This is an area where it was impossible for brands to exist. And in 50 years, brands have come to exist in food service in Britain. Okay, um, in the US slightly earlier. Yeah, yeah, OK. I, you, you're right. I'm not yeah. disagreeing with you. I just want to point out Academically, one of my... Academically, that's the truth. Well, well, 
Well, you know, Sainsbury's was created when? 1869, down the road here. Not one of these food service companies existed 50 years ago. McDonald's, yeah, okay. Bass, Bass is the oldest branded company in the country, and that yeah, became Mitchell's and Butler's. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, sorry, I'm, 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 picking, I'm picking, yeah. But you take my point, yes. generally. Yep. This is, I mean, in my lifetime, 40 years of watching this, I think it's astonishing, the concentration. But you're right, nonetheless, it's still fragmented and it's still messy. Yes, yeah, uh, and, and McDonald's has got a lot of influence. Whether it's good or bad, it's got a lot of influence. Um, Compass has got a different sort of influence. McDonald's got influence by virtue of the fact that everybody knows about it and young people really like going there. Compass has got influence because